Yeah, uh, thank you so much for the introduction and a real pleasure uh, to be here. Um, that works. So my background, indeed, I have a PhD in energy engineering from University College Cork, uh, which is a university in Ireland. And over there, there is a little hub of Plexus modelers who do all kinds of academic-related uh, research um, in extensive collaboration with uh, energy exemplars, so both the London office but also um, all around in general. Um, and last year, and uh, early this year, I transitioned to, transitioned to uh, Dartmouth College at the Sustainable Transitions Lab. Um, besides the research we do with, with Plexus, uh, we do all kinds of research related to energy policy, um, re related to gas grids, but also CO2 capture, um, carbon capture and storage, and more as well. But my uh, specific research during my PhD uh, that started in 2017 uh, related to Plexus World. Plexus World is a uh, global power system model we've developed. Um, there are different versions, versions of Plexus World. It can be for a current day uh, energy system, but also for future decarbonization studies. Um, <clears throat> so, in essence, the first version of the model was a detailed global hourly power system model um, where we modeled every country as an individual region, with larger countries being separated in multiple regions, which in the end also led to um, the integration of these different regions by means of transmission uh, infrastructure uh, with over 600 different uh, pathways. So this is the, um, the overall uh, general spatial representation of our, our model that we build in Plexus. Uh, again, where you can see that larger countries like the US, but also Canada, Brazil, China, and others are separated into um, multiple regions, either based on current electricity markets, operators, um, or based on more geographical um, separation based on states or provinces, etc. cetera. Um, depending on the research question or the, the overall scope, um, this model can be used to run power plants and storage facilities at an individual unit level, um, but also in a more aggregated way to make it more um, approachable for long-term planning studies as well. Um, but because of this wide overall scope, uh, it can be sometimes limited in the level of detail from a more technological viewpoint. For example, we don't um, model any local AC grids and we don't do any load flow modeling either with the global model. Um, we model power plants, uh, mostly larger power plants above uh, a megawatt um, so also larger wind and solar uh, facilities um, with other missing capacity more modeled in an aggregated uh, way as well. Uh, we use this model to do all kinds of case studies for a full global energy system, but we also use it more often than not for a specific region, for specific um, policy questions as well. So because we are uh, academics, we only make use of open data sets. We don't make use of any uh, commercial uh, closed off data sets. Um, for example, we use the World Resources Institute Global Power Plant Database. Um, we use the Energy Storage Database from the Department of Energy. Um, and there is also a really cool database with detailed information of almost all hydro power plants, um, dams, and reservoirs as well in the Global Dam Watch Database. Um, just as an example here uh, of the, the Plexus interface in this case uh, for a detailed unit level and model where we have um, per power plant and fuel type, uh, we have uh, individual capacities, but also uh, heat rates, start costs, and other parameters as well. Um, and the most of these are based on more stylized relationships based on the size of a unit um, and more as well. Um, and we also include uh, the commissioning dates from when these generators were initially initiated uh, for long-term planning studies as well. So just as an example, this is um, animation output from uh, the, our 2015 model. We are also working on a 2020 model, but that is um, still pending. Um, just to show uh, as an example over here where there's still uh, clearly a lot of coal dominance by means of the black bars um, in parts of Asia, China, India, 
Um, and even though in the 2020 model and 2022 model these values might be different, it's still a clear um, dependence on uh, fossil fuel generation. Likewise, um, what we see here is the emission intensity of electricity generation for different regions around the world. Um, and we use data like this and animations like this to really pinpoint where some of the low-hanging fruits are when it comes to global decarbonization efforts um, overall. So here um, in Europe, for example, you see in the Netherlands, where I'm from, but also Poland, uh, still uh, heavily uh, coal intensity in, in generation. Um, and again, big chunks of uh, Asia as well. Where we see in China here is a lot of emission intense generation around the coasts and more wind and hydro based generation in other uh, provinces as well. All of what I've mentioned and shown so far was based on models for current day uh, energy systems. But within academia in general, we're more interested in you know, how we can leverage models like this for different kind of studies um, when it comes to uh, climate change mitigation and overall energy system transition as well. Um, and one of the large projects that we're working on is the assessment of so-called net zero uh, scenarios. Um, for example, based on scenarios from uh, the IPCC assessment reports. These are reports that are being published about every two years uh, with the latest um, information when it comes to different emission trajectories that we have based on current day policies, but also what kind of emission trajectories we'd need for a two degree um, scenario or 1.5 degree scenario and more. Um, and within these reports as well, um, there are modeling teams that perform um, the different kind of mitigation scenarios uh, to reach these set targets. Um, and most of these um, modeling efforts uh, and scenarios are being developed with so-called uh, integrated assessment models. And integrated assessment models, uh, again, are used for the long-term planning of uh, global energy and emission pathways. Um, but because of this long-term focus, um, and also because they have a very broad sectoral focus, these models, they do not only model um, the long-term evolution of the energy system, but they do this in conjunction with impacts of the wider climate system, uh, land use implications, water implications, um, also feedbacks to the wider economic system and how that affects costs of different components of energy. Um, it means that they can be very limited in their way that they model different spatial and temporal aspects. For example, from a spatial viewpoint here on the left, um, have here the integrated assessment model message Globium, which is one of the most commonly used global integrated assessment models. They uh, separate their model in 11 regions, with every region having uh, aggregated capacities, um, aggregated demands, um, unrestricted trade of commodities within these regions. Uh, so that is significantly limited, especially when it comes to the integration of wind and solar, which we all know is very time and uh, space dependent. So then we have the model that we developed, Plexus Rolled, uh, which in context of this project, we use for more snapshot analysis um, of different global power system dynamics based on the scenarios of these integrated assessment models. So we use scenario data from their models, feed it into Plexus, run it for a given year based on hourly, uh, hourly optimization, uh, and assess its overall robustness, also from an adequacy perspective and more. Um, but because of this uh, higher spatial and temporal detail that we have in Plexus World, it means that we limit um, the overall sectoral representation. So we look at the electricity system with some impacts on, um, for example, hydrogen production and hydrogen demand in other sectors as well, but that's about it. Um, but because of that, again, we're able to um, provide more detailed insights from a time and a spatial point of view. Models like this are complementary uh, and they can be connected with each other. And this is something that we've been doing over the last few years by creating a overall methodology and workflow uh, to be able to do this. Um, when it comes to the data side of things, because of these different focuses and different um, spatial representations as well, it means that there's a lot of uh, data flow between the models that also needs to be converted and aggregated um, because of the different model types. Again, from a spatial side of view, 
um, but also from a temporal point of view, where, again, the integrated assessment models, long horizon, and in context of this study with Plexus World, we only look at um, one specific year, for example, 2050 or 2030, and assess its overall robustness. Um, a lot of this data downscaling and conversion is being done outside the modeling tools, but we also leverage the capacity expansion um, module within Plexus, where we use um, the reported capacities from the integrated assessment model and use it as a constraint, um, where we then allow Plexus, Plexus World in this case, uh, up to optimize the allocation of these different capacities to um, a more detailed spatial level. So what you can see here in red is a reported capacities uh, in 2050, which is about uh, 2.7 million megawatts or 2,700 2, gigawatts for the South Asia region. Um, and then Plex of World optimizes this allocation to the different countries and regions within South Asia. So parts of India, parts of China, but also um, Afghanistan, Myanmar, and other countries as well. And this is what that looks like uh, when applying for the full globe. So basically, just like any capacity expansion, um, it's based on low costs, uh, where aspects like resource potentials, resource efficiencies, different fuel prices all determine um, where the optimal capacity uh, is going to be. Uh, with the only difference, again, that we're using the constraints from the integrated assessment model as a data input. For example, here around um, in China, we can see that a lot of the wind-based generation is being um, allocated, integrated in the outer provinces because of higher efficiencies, because there's more space um, and more base load and solar-based generation in the, the coastal provinces where the majority of the demand is as well. Now, um, a second, um, so that was based on the planning side of things, but based on the hourly optimization, um, one thing that we've communicated towards these integrated assessment modeling teams is that the way they model electricity trade between regions, but also within regions, is highly simplified. For example, they assume that within a single region like North America, that there are no constraints on trade. Uh, so they assume that resource potentials in one region uh, can be equally utilized for uh, in another as region of North America. Whereas we show um, with a model like this that because of transmission constraints, um, because of different time zones, because of different temporal aspects, this is highly simplified. And we're also actively working with these teams to improve um, their representation of these electricity system dynamics. So ongoing work right now, we're, um, we're in a large project working with the nine different global uh, integrated assessment modeling teams um, that did the work for in the latest IPCC report to provide more detailed insights in um, these electricity system aspects for their specific scenarios and models. Um, and as you can see here on the left, this graph represents the relative share of electricity over time in overall final energy demand. All of these integrated assessment models project that electricity will get a significantly higher role um, into the future compared to current days. And the same as here shown here on the right, um, regarding the relative share of wind and solar in the overall uh, electricity generation. And that's why an exercise like this, where we benchmark their scenarios from an electricity system viewpoint, uh, becomes more and more relevant uh, because of the larger role of, and the projected larger role of the, the power system overall. Now, this was based on <coughs> some of the work uh, that we're doing, but also based on um, the last few years of working with large global models, large data sets, and Plexus. Um, I've picked up some yeah, useful tips, tips and tricks as well that I'd like to share. Um, whenever we have a new PhD or new student starting with Plexus in one of our groups, one of the first things we do is we let them build a very tiny model um, but at the same time, let them develop the linear programming file behind that specific model as well. Um, a linear programming file basically shows what the mathematics or the objective function is behind your specific Plexus model. Um, and this is something you can generate every time that you run your Plexus model as well. If you make a change, you can directly see how it impacts the formulation. Um, 
And this is essential to really understand your results as well. If you do not understand in detail what is happening behind the software, um, it limits your, your overall application as well. This can be accessed through the diagnostic object in Plexus. Um, I personally recommend to whenever trying to integrate new features in one of your models, to start with as small as possible of a model uh, as you can. And of course you can do this in a bottom-up way by creating a new model every time. But there is also a very useful carve-out tool in Plexus um, where you're able to select a region or a number of regions um, and export this to a new Plexus model. So this not only exports your region objects but also all of its um, all of the other objects and parameters that are linked to these specific regions. Um, and after doing this, testing your new features, then it's also easy to uh, put it back into your, your larger model as well. A um, number of people have talked about this, uh, among others, Glenn as well, but time is very precious when it comes to um, modeling, especially when we're talking about these, these large global models. And of course, there are different, um, different approaches possible to limit your overall computational time. Um, but for us, it's really handy to be able to identify which parameters and variables in your model cause the, the majority of the complexity in your, in your optimization. So there's a, um, a task component um, parameter, also in the diagnostic object, that highlights uh, the non-zeros of the different parameters that you're using. So for this specific model, almost 60% uh, of the non-zeros in this specific model was caused by the startups of specific generators. Now this was a scenario where we basically ran only renewables with some nuclear energy. So for us, startups in that case wasn't that relevant. So by uh, excluding um, startups or by uh, doing it in a, in a more straightforward way, it significantly reduced our runtime with 60 or 70% in the end. Um, this is very computationally heavy to, uh, to report these things, so it's only for testing purposes, uh, generally. And finally, depending on whether you um, run your models on the cloud or still, like us, on hardware, uh, the execution manager is a very useful, um, useful thing as well, because it allows you to stack um, simulations from different databases after each other. So two weeks ago, um, I was on leave for a week, but during that entire week, I just stacked up simulations, uh, and they were all ready when I came back home. And the, the difference with the normal way of using simulations is that it doesn't try to um, open different simulation instances. It just runs it after each other, and that's a very uh, useful thing to do. And this can be accessed through the, access through the execution tab. Um, yeah, this is it for me for now. Uh, in any of the, the next few breaks, or tonight or tomorrow, I'm happy to answer uh, any questions as well as later on in the, the panel here. Um, and also looking forward to talk about any collaboration opportunities or anything like that as well. Thank you.